In December 2009, Arsene Wenger suggested scrapping throw-ins. The Frenchman argued that implementing kick-ins to restart play would significantly speed up the game, but Wenger was not a reliable witness. The previous month, his Arsenal side lost 2-1 at Stoke City, with both the Potters' goals coming from Roy Delap's trademark long throw. That season, it yielded a Premier League high 8 goals and led to 53 shots. Clearly still irked, Wenger suggested outlawing throw-ins, claiming that long throw specialists boasted an unfair and unusual strength in football because their hands can effectively kick the ball. Wenger's view was largely taken with a pinch of salt, but former England striker Gary Lineker also threw his support behind banning throw-ins, but for different reasons. It's called football, Lineker said. What's the point of throw-ins? It takes ages. Just put it down and knock it in. The average Premier League game has 47 throw-ins, and Lineker was right to point out that they slow down football, especially in England's top flight, where a single ball is used. The average Premier League match sees just 58% of action, a standard game lasts for 96 minutes and 24 seconds, including injury time, but the ball is only in play for 55 minutes and 36 seconds, and most likely, that number will drop further with the introduction of video assistant referees this season. The ritual of taking a throw, which can involve handing off or drying the ball, eats up around 8 minutes per match, and is the second lengthiest cumulative stoppage behind free kicks. Goal kicks, corners, injuries and substitutions also run down a significant portion of the clock. The International Football Association Board, or IFAB as it's known, could follow the National Basketball Association's lead and put a shot clock on throw-ins to ensure they're taken quicker or simply ban longer run-ups. An even simpler fix would be to introduce the multi-ball system, which is already employed in the Champions League and has sped up throw-ins by almost one minute per game. But the multi-ball system isn't always faster or fairer. In 2009, Brendan Rodgers' Reading were frequently labelled cheats for allegedly instructing ball boys to delay returning the ball to opponents in order to avoid facing quick throws. Former Queen's Park Rangers boss Ian Holloway also accused Reading of sending their own players to fetch the ball in order to time waste late in games. Tweaking throw-in rules or formats would only be worthwhile if time was actually saved. The goal is to prevent scenarios like last season, when 8 minutes and 15 seconds of Cardiff City's 2-1 home loss to Burnley was spent waiting for Sean Morrison to take throw-ins for the Welsh side at an average of 24.75 seconds each time. Unsurprisingly, the Premier League's most sluggish throw-in takers are predominantly long throw specialists. The slowest throw-in takers are Leicester City's Christian Fuchs, former Cardiff midfielder Aaron Gunnarsson, and Wenger's arch-nemesis Rory de Lapp. De Lapp was notorious for sometimes having more touches with his hands than his feet in matches. In a stalemate at Wolves in 2010, for instance, he took 27 throws and attempted just 16 passes. Throw-ins in the final third, or when under significant pressure, also eat up more time, but still tend to be completed within 15 seconds. And the direction of the throw also affects the timing. When the ball travels forwards, it often moves into a more congested area, making the delivery more complex and time-consuming. There is no denying replacing throw-ins with kick-ins would significantly change the fabric of football, probably creating a more direct game, but it wouldn't necessarily speed things up. Time-wise, kick-ins would really be no different to free kicks, which already occupy the biggest portion of the clock. This is partly down to the players running up from the back or forming walls, as well as debating tactics when within shooting or crossing distance. Lineker probably felt that a quick short kick-in would prove noticeably faster, especially in non-threatening areas of the pitch. But this would only be true if the ball was prevented from leaving the ground, thus reducing potential distance covered and, with a weakened threat as a consequence, it would render the throw-in more of a formality than a weapon. In the absence of making elevated restarts illegal, it's much more likely that players would hoof the ball long when stuck in their own half, much like a goal kick, and straight into the box when closer to the goal. There might be less pressure though, because players would remain more spaced out. Defenders clearly wouldn't stay as close to the throw-in taker or the touchline, knowing the ball could, and surely would, travel considerably further with each restart. Analysis of all Premier League free kicks taken last season within 5 yards of the touchline shows them being slower than throw-ins by over 2 minutes per match. So, axing throws because too many are delivered at a tortoise-like pace isn't actually helpful if kick-ins would take even longer. Of course, arguing football is simply not a game for hands is an entirely different matter and something every goalkeeper would fervently disagree with.
Kick-ins were, however, introduced to futsal in 2006. They must be taken within four seconds, so speed is clearly not an issue, but are quite controversial because across many domestic leagues, they've resulted in a decline in goals. In Spain, home of Europe's top international team, the switch saw a drop in average goals per game from eight to seven. Since futsal is played on a smaller pitch, it is logical to make a link between throw-ins and goals, but in regular football, the throw-in to goal ratio is not overly important. Aside from attacking long throws, it's redundant to judge how many throw-ins lead to goals or scoring opportunities given the variables and time between taking one and any form of goal mouth action. Indeed, a successful throw-in is really just one where possession is retained, and the real skill is to win the ball under pressure. The Premier League average for retained possession under pressure, surprisingly, is just 48.6%, making it the worst league in this category across Europe's big five leagues, who hardly boast glowing stats either. Now this is in part a compliment to the pressing game many Premier League teams play. You could argue that English clubs actually put more thought and effort into defending a throw-in than taking one. Yet the Premier League does also boast, statistically speaking, Europe's second best team at throw-ins. Liverpool retained possession from throws under pressure almost 70% of the time last season, with only two-time Danish champions FC Michelin ahead of them. It's no coincidence, of course, that both clubs also have the same dedicated throw-in coach, Thomas Grunemark, who also holds the world record for the longest ever throw-in at 51.33 metres. The Danes' appointment last summer as part of Jurgen Klopp's coaching staff was ridiculed in some quarters. Former Everton striker Andy Gray jibed he would love to apply to become Klopp's kickoff coach. Even 42-year-old Grunemark admits he has the weirdest job in football, but his impact at Anfield has been nothing short of astonishing in such a short space of time. The season before he joined, Liverpool retained possession from throw-ins under pressure less than half the time, and were the third worst side in the Premier League in this category behind only Swansea City and Huddersfield Town. They also allowed opposing sides to win the ball at an above-average rate of 51.8%. Under Grunemark's tutorage, Liverpool's added time in possession through winning more throws hasn't necessarily led to extra points, since only 55.3% of all Premier League matches are won by the team who keeps more of the ball. But in the Champions League, possession is seemingly more significant, so balls won from throw-ins are more valuable. The stats show the team with more of it wins two-thirds of the time. But naturally, there are some very notable exceptions. Liverpool actually beat Spurs in last season's final in Madrid with just 35% of the ball. Ironically, Gronemark doesn't overly focus on long throw-ins despite it being his personal forte. Left-back Andy Robertson has nonetheless improved his throwing distance from 19 to 30 metres, while defender Joe Gomez surprised Liverpool fans with a long throw-in assist for England last November in a Nations League win over Croatia. A weapon fine-tuned at Liverpool, but rarely used at Anfield. Gronemark instead prefers to focus on what he terms fast and clever throws. These tend to be shorter. Clever throws can involve players switching sides to deliver the ball or unexpected movement and trajectories. The more creative, and often flatter, the better. Fast throws, meanwhile, are important because they don't allow defending teams to take shape. The optimal time to take one is about 5 seconds after the ball goes out of play. When thrown less than 15 metres, the overall chances of retaining possession are close to 70%. This drops below 50% once 10 seconds have elapsed. What all of this shows is that throws shouldn't be thrown out. They have incredible potential that's being virtually ignored by practically every football team. There are clearly ways to speed up the delivery process, and instead of bemoaning the time they take, it might be better for coaches to focus on a more specific way to retain possession. If teams simply won the ball more often, the eight minutes throw-ins take per match might not be such a deadweight loss.